Hello, and welcome to the heart of Fiat Crucified Love. This week, we're going to talk about women in the Bible. And I chose to sit here before this door that I painted of images of Christ with women. You can see on the, the top picture that you can see is the one of Jesus with the woman at the well, who was not of the ordinary chosen people, right? She was an outcast, and um, God chose her. He asked her for a drink, and he called her to conversion. He read her heart, and she became a great prophet for him. She went out and proclaimed his message to her people. And... The next one that you see here is Jesus with Mary and Martha. And this is the place where Mary sat at his feet, listening to him, praying, where Martha worked. And then Martha looked at Mary and compared and got jealous and, and complained about her to Jesus. And Jesus said, Martha, Martha, you're um, worried about many things. Mary has chosen a better part, the best part, which is that of prayer and attentive love. And it won't be taken from her. And that was Christ's way of calling women to remember that their gift of love is more important than what they can do. So they have to have their heart rightly ordered so that when they do serve people in an active way, that it comes from that fountain of attentive love to Jesus. And then we see the next window there where it's Mary Magdalene washing Jesus' feet with her tears and drying them with his, her hair and anointing them with oil. And it's a real intimate gift that Mary Magdalene gives him in great humility. It's part of her own body. It's, it's her tears. And it comes forth from a truly humble and repentant love. Um, and... Then she spends what she has at this, on this um, perfume that she anoints his feet with. And she's even criticized, and Jesus, um, Jesus defends her, right? And says that she's loved much, that they should leave her alone and let her love the way that the Holy Spirit had inspired her to do, to anoint him. So these are three stories that you can see from the New Testament, but we're going to start all the way back with Eve, and we're going to talk about um, God's plan for women and how he raised up in Scripture so many um, saintly women who he called to be important in um, his mission and the formation of his people um, that had to prepare for him coming as a Savior. And then we'll talk about just a few in the New Testament as well. And of course, um, the perfection of women, Our Lady. Um, so that's our plan for this week. And I want to start with a song um, that I wrote for the visitation. And it's that beautiful portrayal of Mary and Elizabeth and their proclamation of God's goodness. Um, and then we'll go on and we'll go through many of these stories. So we pray. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful. Enkindle in us the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit and we will be recreated and thou shalt renew the face of the earth.
Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 
So we will talk about the women of the Bible. And I want to start with Genesis with Eve and the creation of women. It says that God created man in his image and in the divine image he created him. Male and female he created him. God blessed them and said, be fertile and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and all the living things that move on earth. God also said, See, I give you every seed-bearing plant all over the earth and every tree that has seed-bearing fruit on it to be your food. And to all the animals of the land and all the birds of the air and all the living creatures that crawl on the ground, I give all the green plants for food. And so it happened. God looked at everything he made and he found it very good. Evening came and morning followed the sixth day. And then there's the second story of creation. The Lord took the man and settled him in the garden of Eden to cultivate and care for it. And the Lord gave man this order. You are free to eat from any of the trees of the garden except the tree of knowledge of good and evil. From that tree you shall not eat, and the moment you eat from it, you surely are doomed to die. Then the Lord said, It's not good for man to be alone. I will make a suitable partner for him. So the Lord God formed out of the ground various wild animals and various birds of the air. He brought them to the man to see what he would call them, and whatever the man called each of them would be its name. The man gave names to all the cattle, all the birds of the air, and all the wild animals, but none proved to be a suitable partner for him. So the Lord God cast a deep sleep on the man, and while he was asleep, he took out one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. The Lord God then built up into a woman the rib that he had taken from the man. When he brought her to the man, the man said, This one at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. This one shall be called woman, for out of her man this one has been taken. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and clings to his wife, and the two of them become one body. The man and his wife were both naked, yet felt no shame. In the story, we see how man and woman were created equal, equal in dignity and yet different. Man was given the job to cultivate the garden and to name the animals and things like that where woman was created from his side, from his heart, to be a helpmate and to be a suitable partner, to be the presence of love to him. And he clung to her, um, not out of some like natural instinct, but out of a choice of love to receive this gift given to him by God and to return that love to God through loving her and filling her with his life. Be fruitful and multiply, right? They clung to each other in pure nakedness, in original innocence. And they weren't ashamed because um, they were completely full of God. Imagine a body that has never touched or known sin, right? And their bodies were translucent instruments and vessels of the Holy Spirit and his love to each other. What a beautiful gift, right? And so um, that is what Our Lady continued to be. You know, Eve, it goes on there then in the third chapter of Genesis to talk about how Eve um, fell in sin and she was tempted by Satan and then she tempted man to disobey God. She took that apple from Satan. She talked to Satan. And then she ate the fruit, which was against obedience to God. And then she convinced her husband to do that. And because of that, there were consequences, right? No longer were um, her body and her soul perfectly connected and then perfectly connected to Adam, 
right, in a peaceful relationship that's centered in God, and no longer was she connected to God in a peaceful relationship. Everything got got broken because of her doubt and her distrust, her disobedience, and um, there were consequences. And the Lord, you know, said to her that. Um, I will put enmity between you and the woman. He said it to the saint, to Satan, to the snake. Between your offspring and hers, he will strike at your head while you strike at his heel. Right? And so, you know, eventually our lady came as that perfect vessel that struck at his head and stomped on Satan and um, overcame him. Um, saint Irenaeus, today is the day of our lady of Dewar. Not Saint Irenaeus said you know, that by Eve's sin, she created knots in her own soul and in her relationship to God and the relationship of humanity with each other. But Our Lady came with that perfect trust, that perfect obedience, that perfect um, humility and purity and love, and she undid the knots of, of Eve and her sin just by saying yes, just by her trustful surrender to God and everything um, through her immaculate heart. But there still were consequences to sin. And God said, you know, I will intensify the pains of your childbearing. In pain, you will bring forth children. And your urge will be for your husband and he will be your master. And, you know, the consequence of disobeying God means that you'll suffer, right? And Our Lady nobly, bravely suffered all at the foot of the cross. She gave birth to all of us in the church through her union with Jesus crucified. And, um, you know, she overcame all temptation um, of a neediness. You know, God created women to be a helpmate, but so often women are needy, right? Why? It's the opposite of the gift God gave them, to be a helpmate to man, to be that foundation of a firm, trustful, faithful love. And that's why women can um, tend to, oops, sorry, I don't know what that was. Um, that women can tend to nag or to do things that um, that frustrate the relationship where Our Lady was just that tower of ivory, that, that firm foundation of faith that, that Jesus even could lean on when he saw her on the way of the cross, that he could entrust John to at the foot of the cross. And... Um, and even Mary in her sinlessness had to suffer that consequence of sin. And yet the story is not hopeless for Eve. Mary came and said yes to God. And Jesus came and redeemed all of humanity, including Eve. And it was still true that the man called his wife Eve because she was the mother of all the living, right? And um, that Eve still was given that gift of mothering for humanity. God didn't, like, destroy her and start over, create a new woman from a new man made from dust. No. That's the beauty of redemption, right? That except for Our Lady, no woman, even that we're going to talk about through all of Scripture, was perfect. But each one had something very beautiful that kind of foreshadowed that perfection in Our Lady. So just as Eve was taken from the side of Adam, Mary was, was formed really from the side of Christ. Her immaculate conception was a gift of the passion of Christ applied earlier in time. And um, Our Lady, you know, as Eve said no, Mary said yes. And Eve was called the mother of the living, where Our Lady is the true mother of the living, because our life is in heaven. It's only in heaven. And um, she, through her fiat, allowed the incarnation to take place. And that's the impetus for opening the gates of heaven to us. So Our Lady really is the mother of the living, right? Um, through sin, Eve was supposed to be a mother of living, and she gave forth, you know, death. Um, death to humanity's relationship with God through her sin. That Our Lady, you know, was that new Eve. So it's really beautiful to see. The next woman we're going to talk about is Sarah. You know, Abraham, he was old, and his wife was Sarah. And God had made a covenant with Abraham and had promised him many descendants, as many as the stars in the sky or the sands and the seashore. 
and he was getting on an age. It seemed hopeless, but he trusted. And one day, three visitors came to him, and a lot of people um, think that it was the Holy Trinity, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and these guests. And Abraham showed beautiful hospitality to them. And while they were eating, they asked him, where is your wife, Sarah? And he said, they are in the tent. And one of them said, I will surely return to you this time next year, and Sarah will have a son. And Sarah was listening at the entrance of the tent just behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in years, and Sarah had stopped having her womanly periods. So Sarah laughed to herself and said, now that I am so withered and my husband so old, am I still to have sexual pleasure? But the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, shall I really bear it? child old as I am is anything too marvelous for the Lord to do so Sarah she was chosen you know if Abraham was supposed to be the father of faith Sarah was supposed to be his helpmate in that and yet she was a mother of doubt in that moment she laughed at the plans of God she looked at them humanly and yet God didn't abandon her he corrected her and he encouraged her faith he said is anything too marvelous for the Lord to do he asks us that. Is there anything? We're supposed to have faith like our lady. That, you know, she was told, here Sarah was told that she would have a son in her old age. Our lady was told that she would have a son without any sexual relations. And yet she believed in the impossible, right? Nothing is impossible for God, said the angel Gabriel. And the Trinity here, the angels said, is anything too marvelous for the Lord to do? At the appointed time, about this time next year, I will return to you and Sarah will have a son. And it happened. Sarah did have a son, right? And so we see that, you know, the Lord's redemption of woman um, had to begin and work throughout a long period of time in building her faith back to be um, what he conceived for her to be at the beginning. You know, Eve was created to have this perfect relationship with God, and she disobeyed. The result of that is that Sarah was called to be the helpmate of Abraham, the father of the faith, and she doubted. But God didn't abandon them. He continued to call them to great holiness and to bless them, and Sarah did have Isaac, right? And um, Isaac grew, and Isaac eventually was to marry Rebecca. She's another very beautiful, holy woman of scripture. And um, Abraham promised that he would find Isaac a wife. And he sent, um, he sent some servants on this mission to find a wife for Isaac, right? He said, you know, um, I, I don't take my son back to the land we migrated from, you know. I want to make sure that he has a daughter from, um, a wife from our people, you know, a daughter of the Canaanites among whom I live. So he didn't want the people from a faraway country that worshipped false gods to form a family with Isaac. So the servant promised, I will find a good and holy woman. And, um, the servant took 10 of his master's camels, bearing all kinds of gifts from his master, and his, he made his way to the city of Nahor. Near evening, at the time when women go out to draw water, he made the camels kneel by the well outside the city, and then he prayed, right? He prayed to find a woman of great worth for Isaac. Lord God of my master Abraham, let it turn out favorable for me today, and thus deal graciously with my master Abraham. While I stand here at the spring and the daughters of the townsmen are coming out to draw water, if I say to a girl, please lower your drug, jug that I may drink, and she answers, take a drink, and let me give water to your camels too, let her be the one who you have decided upon for your servant Isaac. And this way I will know that you have dealt graciously with my master. So the servant of Abraham knew that God sees the heart and that God would choose somebody with a heart that would be a faithful wife to Isaac, that would be pleasing with him to form a marriage in the Lord, right? For this work that God had for, for them as like the patriarchs of the Israelite people, right? So scarcely had the servant entrusted this mission to the Lord, prayed about it, 
When Rebecca came out with a jug on her shoulder, the girl was very beautiful, a virgin untouched by man, and she went down to the spring and filled her jug. When she came up, the servant ran toward her and said, please give me a sip of water from your jug. Take and drink, sir, she replied, and quickly lowered the jug onto her hand. She gave him a drink, and when she let him drink his fill, she said, I will draw water for your camels too until they have drunk their fill. With that, she quickly emptied her jug into the drinking trowel and ran back to the well to draw more water until she had drawn water and wa um, enough for all the camels. The man watched her the whole time, silently waiting to learn whether or not the Lord had made his errand successful. When the camels finished drinking, the man took out a gold ring weighing half a shekel which he fastened on her nose and two gold bracelets weighing 10 shekels and put them on her wrists. Then he asked her, whose daughter are you? Tell me please, and is there room in your father's house for us to spend the night? She answered, I'm the daughter of Bethuel, the son of Milcah, whom she bore to Nahor. There's plenty of straw and fodder at our place, she added, and room to spend the night. The man bowed down in worship to the Lord, saying, Blessed be the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who has not let his constant kindness toward my master fail. As for myself also, the Lord has led me straight to the house of my master's brother. So that is the way that the Lord revealed that, that beautiful heart of Rebecca to the servant, right? And when the servant met her parents, he said, I'm Abraham's servant. The Lord blessed my master so abundantly he has become a wealthy man, right? My master's wife, Sarah, bore a son to my master in her old age, and he has given him everything he owns. My master put me under oath, saying, You shall not procure a wife for my son among the daughters of the Canaanites in whom the land I live. Instead, you shall go to my father's house to my own relatives to get a wife for my son. When I asked my master, what if the woman will not follow me? He replied, the Lord in whose presence I have always walked will send his messenger with you and make your errand successful. And so you will get a wife for my son from my own kindred of my father's house. And so then he told the story of coming to the spring that day and how the Lord had um, revealed Rebecca to him, right? And his household said, this thing comes from the Lord. We can say nothing to you either for or against it. Here is Rebecca ready for you. Take her with you that she may become the wife of your master's son, as the Lord has said. And they replied, or they rejoiced, right? Um, they prayed over her and said, sister, may you grow into thousands of myriads and may your descendants gain possession of the gates of their enemies. So it's really beautiful to see how, you know, even though Eve had turned from the Lord and, um, you know, Sarah had doubted, the Lord did not abandon these chosen people. And um, he found a worthy wife for Isaac um, in Rebecca. And Rebecca, you know, served with him all the days of her life. Um, she was an example of holiness. If you read the stories about her, and um, she had um, a few different children. She had, Rebecca had um, Jacob and uh, Esau. And um, She led Jacob, it's interesting, I always had a problem with this because she preferred Jacob and um, she led Jacob to deceive his father into getting the family blessing instead of Esau. But it was because she saw in Jacob an honesty and a goodness that she wanted to um, pass on to her descendants, right? It is said that Esau was a little bit more wild, right? He sold his birthright for a cup of a bowl of soup. And so, um, you know, Jesus says that the people of this world are more cunning in dealing with their own than the people of the light. I think that the cunningness of Rebecca, um, 
can show an integrity of her heart in wanting to preserve um, the promises of the Lord um, and entrust them to the son who she knew was more worthy that would fulfill them um, in a better way. And then it became time where Jacob needed to marry. And um, the Lord, it's interesting because Jacob deceived his father to get the blessing. And then, you know, sin begets sin. Jacob was deceived when he went. He fell in love with Rachel and he went to marry Rachel. And Rachel's father deceived Jacob and switched and, and, and had him marry Leah without his knowledge. And then he had to work another you know, 12 years, I believe it was, to win, be able to marry Rachel, who was his first love. Um, and Rachel had a life of great suffering. She was barren, and um, she felt less loved by Jacob, even though she was his first love. Um, because Leah was very um, fertile. She had many, many children. Rachel, although she was more beautiful and the one more tender to the heart of Jacob, um, she was not bearing children. She feels um, unloved, right? Um, and he did love her more. When Rachel saw that she failed to bear children to Jacob, she became envious, which is not good, right? And this is like in those times where um, they weren't always faithful. So like Jacob had two wives, right? And he not only had children with the wives, but the wives' servants and things. Um, it was a time before um, the Lord really came down hard on the idea of monogamy, right? <laughs> that um, a husband and wife need to be faithful to, to one person, right? Um, but then... Rachel did bear a son, and um, her son was Jacob's favorite son. It was Joseph. And um, I'm looking for the actual, I marked this, but um, and you know, um, there is a um, there is a a need for the redemption of Christ that we see even in the midst of these stories of these holy women of the past, right? They um they were faithful in the way that they knew to be faithful, and um, they followed the law of the Lord as it had been laid down, um, but they didn't have a personal, intimate relationship with God the way that those of the New Testament were able to have because they saw the face of God in Jesus in a personal way. Um, but all of these years where we hear these stories of these holy women, um, just the presence of their lives among the Israelites formed the Israelites um, with hearts that were then able to receive such a personal Savior, right? These women were, um, compared to the pagans, were great examples of faith. And yet, they were lacking that perfection of faith that we see in Our Lady, right? And, um, you know, here you've got Rachel vying for all of these children and giving her servants, right, so that they could all sleep with her husband to have children on her behalf. And then you've got Our Lady, who trusted in God that she would conceive and do his will and be the mother of Christ even without sexual relations, you know? She never doubted. And um, you can see her great perfection of faith in reflection with the Old Testament ladies who had faith, but not that perfection of it. Um, 
Another beautiful example, though, or a foreshadowing um, of the holiness that Jesus would call women to was in um, Moses' sister, Miriam, right? You know, the Pharaoh said that the uh, midwives had to kill all of the Israelite sons. And a certain man from the house of Levi married a Levite woman who conceived and bore a son, who was Moses. Seeing that he was a goodly child, she hid him for three months, and when she could hide him no longer, she took a papyrus basket, daubed it with bitmoon and pitch, and put the child in it, placing it among the reeds on the river bank. And his sister Miriam stationed herself at a distance to find out what would happen to him. So you've got this little girl who is very important in um, the history of Israel because Moses is very you know, important. Moses is the one that delivers the people of Israel from Pharaoh. But his life would not have been spared if his sister Miriam did not watch over him, right? And when Pharaoh's daughter came down to the river to bathe, her maids walked around among the river bank. And noticing the basket among the reeds, she sent her handmaid to fetch it. And opening it, she looked, and though there was a baby boy crying, she was moved with pity for him and said, It's one of the Hebrews' children. Then his sister Miriam asked Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call one of the Hebrew women to nurse a child for you? Yes, do so, she said. So the maiden went and called the child's own mother. So Miriam not only watched over her little brother to protect him, but then interceded on his behalf and approached with courage Pharaoh's daughter and said, can I find somebody to nurse him? Um, you know, it's very beautiful to see that even in the um, heart of this child, um, and these are people who have not had the fullness of redemption that like you and I have through the passion of Christ that had not happened yet, but she had a faith that God would protect her brother and a courage to defend him and because of that you know her defense um, and her protection of Moses he was able to deliver all of the people from it from Pharaoh's rule so it's you know a beautiful foreshadowing of then Our Lady as the young girl who also um, not only conceived Jesus and protected him in her womb but then protected him from Herod protected him from the world nurtured him gave him life so that he could become our savior and deliver us from hell, right? Another beautiful woman of the Old Testament is Deborah. Um, and the prophetess Deborah, this is from the book of Judges, was judging Israel. She used to sit under Deborah's palm tree situated in Ramah and Bethel in the mountain region of Ephraim. And there the Israelites came up to her for judgment. Here's a beautiful foreshadowing of Our Lady's seat of wisdom, right? Um, Deborah must have had a certain anointing from God to really be full of grace, to be able to be the mouthpiece for him, for the people. And she sent and summoned um, Barak, the son of Abinoam, and said, this is what the Lord God of Israel commands. She said, go, march on, march on Mount Tabor. Take with you 10,000 Nephilites, right? And he she tells him that God will deliver the enemies into his power. But he doubted that he would be able to do this, right? He said, if you come with me, I will go. If you do not come with me, I will not go. And so she said, okay, like you don't have faith in God, I'll have faith in God, right? Just like Our Lady's faith was greater than any of the patriarchs. She said, I'll certainly go with you, but you will not gain the glory in the expedition on which you're setting out, for the Lord will have Sisera fall into the power of a woman, right? So it was, you know, Deborah who helped the people. And when that happened, she prayed a great song of praise to the Lord 
And it reminds me a lot of the Magnificat, where Our Lady, when she is praised by for the good things that God is doing in her life, she deflects it. She proclaims the greatness of the Lord. She says, you know, you are the one that has, you know, done great and holy things through my lowliness, my littleness. And Deborah, she does the same thing. She foreshadows the Magnificat. She says, of chiefs who took the lead in Israel, of noble deeds by the people who bless the Lord, hero kings give hero princes. I to the Lord will sing my song, my hem to the Lord, the God of Israel. O Lord, when you went out from Seir, when you marched from the land of Edom, the earth quaked, the heavens were shaken, while the clouds sent down showers. Mountains trembled in the presence of the Lord. Right? And it goes on, when I, Deborah, arose, when I rose a mother in Israel, new gods were their choice. Then the war was at their gates. Not a shield could be seen, nor a lance among 40,000 in Israel. My heart is with the leaders of Israel, the nobles of the people who bless the Lord. Awake, awake, Deborah, awake, awake, strike up a song, strength, arise, Barak, make despoilers of your spoils, son of Abner. So it, she goes on and on to say how the people were in trouble, and that's why God raised her up as a mother. What the leader of the people as a warrior could not do because he was afraid, she could do because of her motherly heart. And that's something that had its root in Eve. She was made the mother of the living. And in the creation of Eve, she was given those natural gifts of protection and of nurturing. And it's something that strengthens a woman um, when you have a love of the children entrusted to you. And so Deborah was not just a judge and she wasn't just a warrior. She was a mother. She was a lover of her children. And so that's why she was able to deliver them. And um, it was, it's really a foreshadowing of that great wisdom of Our Lady and her power over us um, and her guidance of us. Um, it comes from a heart that is more mother than warrior, even if she's the one that stomps on the head of Satan. Then we see the beautiful story of, of faithfulness of Ruth. Ruth is um, the daughter-in-law of Naomi, and Naomi had two daughters and uh, daughter-in-laws, and her sons died, her husband died, and she told them to go back to their people. But um, Ruth said to her, do not ask me to abandon or forsake you. So again, you see the faithfulness of this womanly heart. For wherever you go, I will go. And wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. Wherever you die, I will die and there be buried. May the Lord do so and so to me and more besides, if aught but death separates me from you. So it's so beautiful. It's her love for her mother-in-law and her faithfulness that make her travel back to Naomi's people with her. And they go back to Bethlehem. And Ruth is going to be woven directly into the ancestry of Christ, right? Um, Naomi says, you know, they had to go out and glean food from the fields. And Naomi says to her, you know, I don't want something bad to happen. So stay in the field of Obed. He's a very just and, and godly man. He was a good man of Israel. And, and Ruth was humble enough to heed her mother-in-law's advice. And she did that. And he looked out for her. He said, stay here so I can protect you, right? Adam was supposed to protect Eve in the garden, and, and he didn't protect her from Satan, right? And um, here we see where Obed is already foreshadowing that protection that Christ will give to us. He says, stay in my field so nothing bad happens. I will protect you. I will be an authentic man, right? to you and your vulnerability. Um, so then her mother-in-law said, my daughter, I must seek a home for you that will please you. Is not Boaz with whose servants you were a relative of ours? 
This evening he will be winnowing barley on the threshing floor. So bathe and anoint your, yourself. I said Obed, it's Boaz, sorry. So bathe and anoint yourself and put on your best attire and go down to the threshing floor. Do not make yourself known to the man before he's finished eating and drinking. But when he lies down, take note of the place where he does so and then cover a place at his feet. And I will tell you what to do. So she did that. And he asked that night, who are you? And she said, I'm your servant, Ruth. Spread the corner of your cloak over me for you're not my next of kin. And he said, may the Lord bless you, my daughter. You have been even more loyal now than before in not going after young men, whether poor or rich. Be assured, daughter, I will do for you whatever you say. All my townspeople know you are a worthy woman. It's so incredible because we pray here as Christians, as Catholics of the you know 21st century, um, prayers to St. Joseph and his holy cloak. When you see an image of Joseph, um, the foster father of Jesus, he always has a cloak. And we always pray to him that just as he covered our lady in Jesus and his cloak and his manly protection, that he would do that for us. Well, it has its roots back in the Old Testament. When you ask somebody to cover you with their cloak, it means to extend their protection over you. And that's really what a man was for his wife. And you see this here. Ruth says to Boaz, cover me with your cloak, right? And um, it's a foreshadowing, too, of Christ who on the cross covers us with the cloak of his body, of his flesh, of his blood which protects us from Satan, which recreates us, right? And gives us new life. And as Boaz covers Ruth with his cloak and marries her, they come together naked as man and wife. And Ruth conceives and she has a son and she names him Obed, right? And he is the father of Jesse, who's the father of David, who is the ancestor of Christ. And it's so beautiful because it's a foreshadowing of the purity of marriage and that faithfulness that Christ will call marriages to be. One man and one woman who are naked together without shame and whose love is so pure and so full that it gives fruit in um, Christ-like people in the world, right? Like David foreshadowed Christ. Um, and it's just, it's a beautiful foreshadow. You know, of, of Mary and Joseph and of the sort of relationship that Christ has with us in the church. Another beautiful woman in the Old Testament is Hannah. And um, there was a certain man from Ramathia, sorry, Elkiah by name. I'm going to skip over all of that. Um, who had two, who, two wives, right? One was Hannah and the other was Peninia. Peninia had children, but Hannah was childless. This man regularly went on pilgrimage from his city to worship the Lord of hosts and sacrifice to him, right? When the day came for him to offer sacrifice, he used to give a portion each to his wife, Pinia, and to all her sons and daughters, but a double portion to Hannah because he loved her more, right? Even though she was barren. And her rival used to mock her for being barren, and she would cry, and her husband would say, Hannah, why do you weep and grieve and refuse to eat? Am I not more to you than ten sons? He didn't care that she was barren. He loved her, and he, he allowed her, he gave her the ability to offer a double sacrifice to the Lord, and um, it, it's very beautiful. So Hannah rose after one such meal and presented herself before the Lord. And Eli, the priest, was sitting on a chair near the doorpost of the Lord's temple at that time. In Hannah's bitterness, she prayed to the Lord, weeping copiously, and made a vow, promising, Lord of hosts, if you look with pity on the misery of your handmaid, if you remember me and do not forget me, if you give your handmaid a male child, I will give him to the Lord for as long as he lives." Neither wine nor liquor shall he drink, and no razor shall ever touch his head. As she remained long at prayer before the Lord, Eli watched her mouth, for Hannah was praying silently. And he falsely accused her. He thought she was drunk, and he yelled at her. And she said, it isn't that. 
I am an unhappy woman. I have neither had wine nor liquor. I was pouring out my troubles to the Lord. Um, you know, my prayer has been prompted by my deep sorrow and misery. And Eli the priest said, go in peace. May the Lord of Israel grant you what you've asked. And she said, think kindly of your maidservant and left. And she went to her quarters and she no longer was downcast. And early the next morning, they worshiped before the Lord and returned to their home. And when he had relations with his wife, the Lord remembered her and she conceived and she had a son named Han Samuel. And she wanted to fulfill his the vows. She said to her husband, once the child's weaned, I will take him and, and present him to the Lord and, and offer him to the temple again, right? And when she did this, she prayed that beautiful prayer that also is foreshadowed um, foreshadowing the Magnificat. My heart exalts in the Lord. My horn is exalted in my God. I have swallowed up my enemies. I rejoice in my victory. There is no one holy like the Lord, no rock like our God. Speak boastfully no longer, nor let arrogance issue from your mouths, for an all-knowing God is the Lord, a Lord God who judges deeds, right? The Lord puts to death and gives life. He casts down to the netherworld. He raises it up again. The Lord makes poor and rich. He humbles. He exalts. He raises the needy from the dust. It's so beautiful. Hannah's um, conception, it kind of foreshadows St. Elizabeth and her elderly age where she was barren and she was in the temple um, praying her, her husband also went to the temple and offered sacrifice, and um, she conceived John the Baptist, and um, it says about him that no razor would touch him, and that he would never drink wine, he would be somebody, you know, um, chosen by the Lord for a great mission, which was to usher in the reign of, of Christ, and, um, you know, Samuel was a very important prophet in the time of Israel. And even as a small child, the Lord spoke to him in the temple. And it's just, it's a beautiful thing to see, you know, the virtue of women in the shadow of God's presence growing here, um, even before the fullness of time comes and Christ comes, right? We see how the Lord, um, like he uses salt to preserve what is good, um, even though sin had entered into the Israelites after Eve and Adam sinned, um, he preserved what was good in woman. And um, he inspired Hannah to offer her son. And he um, was faithful in choosing Samuel for a great role, right? And you see that, that beautiful gift of a mother who offered her son back to God. You know, just like Mary and Joseph had to present Jesus to the temple, um, Hannah offered her son to the Lord and, um, and made that sacrifice, which was really beautiful. And it really foreshadows the ultimate sacrifice of Christ, our great priest, prophet, and king, who would die on the cross. Another beautiful woman of the Old Testament is Sarah in the book of Tobit. And Sarah... Um, married many men and they were all strangled to death on um, her wedding night and um, her maids would abuse her because seven husbands had been killed they would mock her and then she was so sad she was worried that she was displeasing to God that she prayed she had faith enough to pray but she prayed for death and God heard her prayer and sent her Saint Raphael the archangel to cast out the demon that was um, killing her husbands and to bring her a holy husband um, so that, you know, the book of Tobit is looked to in scripture as like the highlight of what marriage should be, right? And, um, and Raphael guides Tobit to find um, Sarah and he asks for her hand in marriage. She, you know, he's, he's taken by her great beauty and her holiness and Sarah's husband said, I will do, or father said, I will do it, right? I will, I will let you marry my daughter. She is yours according to the decree of the book of Moses. Your marriage to her has been decided in heaven. 
Here we see, you know, again, the hand of God in marriage, where heaven had chosen one man for one woman to be an example of holy love. Take your kinswoman. From now on, you are her love, and she is your beloved. She is yours today and ever after. And tonight, son, may the Lord of heaven prosper you both. May he grant you mercy and peace. Then Raguel called his daughter Sarah, and she came to him. He took her by the hand and gave her to Tobiah with the words, Take her according to the law, according to the decree written in the book of Moses. She is your wife. Take her and bring her back safely to your father, and may the God of heaven grant both of you peace and prosperity. Right? And her mother said, Be brave, my daughter. May the Lord of heaven grant you joy in place of your grief. Have courage. She was afraid to get married, and she was afraid to consummate the marriage. She was afraid that Satan would kill Tobit. <laughs> but she had faith. And Tobit, Tobiah was such a holy man of God. He realized that more in, than choosing a wife um, that would please his flesh, that he needed to choose a godly woman and to base their marriage in the promises and the blessing of the Lord. And so Tobiah listened to the messenger of God, Raphael, and followed his instructions. And when the girl's parents left the bedroom and closed the door, Tobiah rose from bed. He didn't say, come, let's consummate this marriage. He said to his wife, my, life, my love, get up. Let us pray and beg our Lord to have mercy on us and to grant us deliverance. She got up and they started to pray and beg the deliverance might be theirs. And he prayed this beautiful prayer. Blessed are you, O God of our fathers. Praise be your name forever and ever. Let the heavens and all your creation praise you forever. You made Adam. You gave him his wife Eve to be his help and support. And from these two, the human race descended. You said it's not good for man to be alone. Let us make him partner like himself. Now, Lord, you know that I take this wife of mine, not because of lust, but for a noble purpose. Call down your mercy on me and on her and allow us to live together to a happy old age. They said, amen, amen, and they went to bed for the night, right? They didn't even consummate the marriage. Their consummation of their marriage was their prayer. And I love that line, this, you know, I take the sister of mine. That's the sort of purity of love that was between the hearts of Joseph and Mary. And the fruit of their love was Christ. And, um, and Toba, Tobiah and Sarah were blessed greatly. Another incredible um, example of a holy woman of God is Judith. And... Um, how she delivers the Jews, and she's a great foreshadowing of Our Lady as, as the queen of heaven and earth that stomps on the head of Satan. And in the book of Judith, it says, In those days, Judith, the daughter of Merari, son of Joseph, son of Ozel, it goes on and on, right? Um, her husband of her own tribe and clan had died at the time of the barley harvest. And while he was in the field supervising those who bound the sheaves, he suffered a sunstroke, right? The widowed Judith remained three years and four months at home where she set up tent for herself on the roof of her house. She put on sackcloth about her loins and wore a widow's weed. She fasted all the days of her widowhood except the Sabbath eves and Sabbaths, new moons, right? She was beautifully formed and lovely to behold. Her husband had left her gold and silver, servants and maids, right? But instead, she decided to pray and fast, not to indulge herself in vain things. No one had a bad word to say about her, for she was God-fearing. When Je Judith, therefore, heard the harsh words which the people, discouraged by their lack of water, had spoken against their ruler, right? She sent the maid who was in charge of her things to ask the elders of the city to visit her. And when they came, she chastised them. Judith had um, that power of a prophetess. She spoke that word of God that was living and effective, sharper than a two-edged sword. And she was able to do that because her heart was humble and pure, because she lived in sackcloth and, and, and fasted and prayed. And she had suffered the death of her husband to 
And in the midst of all of this, she used it as an offering to be a victim of love to the Father. And so he descended his spirit upon her, and she was able to deliver the people. When they came, she said, listen to me, rulers of the people. What you have said to the people today is not proper. You promised to hand over the city to our enemies at the end of five days, unless within that time the Lord comes to your aid. You interposed between God and yourselves this oath which you took. Who are you then that you should have put God to the test this day, setting yourselves in the place of God in human affairs? It's the Lord Almighty for whom you're laying down conditions. You will never understand anything, will you? You cannot plumb the depths of the human heart or grasp the workings of the human mind. How then can you fathom God who has made all these things and discern his mind and understand his plans? No, my brothers, do not anger the Lord our God. For if he doesn't wish to come to our aid within five days, he has it equally within his power to protect us at such a time as he pleases or to destroy us in the face of our enemies. It is not for you to make the Lord our God give surety for his plans, right? God does not get moved by threats or ultimatums. While we wait for the salvation that comes from him, let us call upon him to help us. He will hear our cry if it's his good pleasure. So here she's chastising them, and she's just this pillar of faith and wisdom, right? And it comes from her holiness of heart, even though she was beautiful and wealthy, that when her husband died, she, she lived a life of prayer and penitence, right? She said, let us set an example for our kinsmen. Let us be, um, you know, depend on the defense of God for us. And they said, you know, you are incredible. We'll listen to you. And she said, listen to me, I will do something that will go down from generation to generation among the descendants of our race. Stand in the gate tonight and let me pass. So not only did she speak words of chastisement and wisdom, she was willing to go out and face the enemy. Just like Our Lady went face to face with Satan and stomped on him with her humility and her love and her purity. And so Judith, before she went to fight these enemies of Israel, she prayed. Prayer is the source of holiness in all of the women of Scripture. She threw herself down prostrate with ashes strewn upon her head, wearing nothing over her sackcloth. While the incense was being offered in the temple of God in Jerusalem, she let the priests be priests, but she did her prayer and fasting. And God chose her, right? He used the prayers of the priests of the incense being offered to help her as, her, as his instrument. Judith prayed to the Lord with a loud voice, Lord God of my forefather Simon, you put a sword in his hand to take re revenge upon the foreigners who had immodestly loosened the maiden's girdle and shamefully exposed her thighs and disgracefully violated her body, right? You smote the slaves together with their princess, your wives you handed over. Oh my God, hear me also a widow. It is you who were the author of those events and of what preceded and of those that followed them, the present also and the future you have planned. Whatever you devise comes into being, the things you decide on come forward and say, here we are. All your ways are in readiness and your judgment is made with foreknowledge. Here are the Assyrians of vast forests, priding themselves on horse and rider, boasting of the power of their infantry, trusting in shield and spear, bow and sling, they do not know that you, the Lord, crush warfare. Lord is your name. Shatter their strength and your might. Crush the force and your wrath. For they have resolved to profane your sanctuary, defile the tent where your glorious name resides, and to overthrow with iron the horns of your altar. See their pride and send forth your wrath upon their heads. Give me a widow, the strong hand to execute my plan that the guile of my lips smite the slave together with the ruler, the ruler together with his servant, crush their pride by the hand of a woman. Your strength is not in numbers, nor does your power depend upon stalwart men, but you are the God of the lowly. I pray this all the time. You are the God of the lowly, the helper of the oppressed, the supporter of the weak, 
the protector of the forsaken, and the savior of those without hope. Please, please, God of my forefather, God of the heritage of Israel, Lord of heaven and earth, creator of the waters, king of all you have created, hear my prayer. And Judith went out and she cut off the head of um, Holofer Holofernes, right? She delivered her people. Another great woman of the Old Testament is Esther. She's a poor Jew, and the king chooses her to be his queen. And she has to follow all of these, you know, pagan rituals and things, but her heart, heart is Jewish. He doesn't even know that. And then one of his advisors comes out and is trying to destroy the Jewish people. And, and her foster father, Mordecai, comes to her and says, you know, this is why God raised you up. Not so that you can hide in the safety of the palace, but so you can deliver the people. Have that motherly heart for the Jewish people and intercede for them, even if it's at the risk of death. She does the same thing Judith does. She rests her courage and her hope, her strength within prayer, right? Queen Esther, seized with mortal anguish, likewise had recourse to the Lord, taking off her splendid garments of a queen. She put on garments of distress and mourning, right? In place of her precious ointments, she covered her head with dirt and ashes. She afflicted her body severely. All her festive adornments were put aside and her hair was wholly disheveled. Then she prayed to the Lord, the God of Israel, saying, my Lord, our King, you alone are God. Help me who am alone and who have no one but you. I myself praying that so often. Help me, Lord, who am alone and have no one but you. You know, what did God say? It is not good that man should be alone. And he created Eve to be with him. And yet, so often these women of the Old Testament found themselves alone, and yet they weren't. Because they were the helpmate of God. God came and took the place of um, what man was to be for them. And we see that in a really powerful way in Our Lady, but it's foreshadowed here in Esther. Help me, Lord, who am alone and have no one but you. I'm taking my life in my hand, right? As a child, I heard from the people of the land of my forefathers that you, O Lord, chose Israel from among all peoples and our fathers from among all their ancestors as a lasting heritage, that you fulfilled all your promises to them. Now we've sinned in your sight. You've delivered us into the hands of our enemies because we worship their gods. You are just. She's humble. She knows they've done wrong. You are just, O oh Lord, but now they are not satisfied with our bitter servitude. They've undertaken to do away with the decree that you've pronounced and to destroy your heritage, right? O oh Lord, do not relinquish your scepter to those who are not. Do not let them glow over our ruin. You know all things. You know I hate the glory of pagans, right? You know I'm under constraint. I abhor the sign of grandeur that rests on my head when I appear in public. O oh Lord, God of Abraham, God more powerful than all, hear the voice of those in despair. Save us from the power of the wicked and deliver me from my fear. Then she goes to the king. She intercedes for the people and they're saved, right? In the book of Sirach, it says, Happy the husband of a good wife, twice lengthened are his days. A worthy wife brings joy to her husband, peaceful and full as his life. A good wife is generous gift, bestowed upon him who fears the Lord. Be he rich or poor, his heart is content and a smile is ever on his face. All of these women I discussed in the Old Testament can be personified in that. They were good and holy women who gave joy to their husbands, even if their husbands were pagan, like Esther's husband, right? His heart melted. It says that his heart, he was like a lion, and it melted in front of her because God melted his heart by her penance and her prayer and her love. And he became gentle and did the will of God, even not being a Jew. Women are called to lead their husbands to holiness to use that motherly instinct that they were created with, to be the mother of the living, 
to give life to their children and to their husbands, to their people. So beautiful. Nobody did that more perfectly than Our Lady. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town of Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man named Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. Coming to her, he said, Hail, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at what was said and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of David his father, and he will rule over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I have no relations with a man? And the angel said to her in reply, The Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. Behold, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age. And this is the sixth month of her who is called barren. For nothing will be impossible for God. And Mary said, Behold, I'm the handmaiden of the Lord. May it be done unto me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. And all of the, the scriptures I read from the Old Testament, women came to God with great faith and asked something from him. But in the story of Our Lady, Our Lady was so humble she didn't even suspect. God came to her. God bestowed a great grace on her, kind of like that original grace that was given to Eve. And Our Lady, with perfect faith and for perfect docility and hope and surrender and love, said fiat, said, I want God's will, and opened herself fully so that Christ could become incarnate, could completely recreate humanity. And we see that relationship between man and woman healed as Our Lady receives Christ into her womb, into her heart. And then God entrusts her to Joseph in a pure and holy way. It says in Matthew, when his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found with child through the Holy Spirit. Joseph, her husband, a righteous man, unwilling to expose her to shame, decided to divorce her quietly. Such was his intention when, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary, your wife, to your home. For it's through the Holy Spirit this child has been conceived in her. She will be your son, and you are to name him Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. And all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. Behold, the virgin will be with child and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph awoke, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. You know, Adam, he disobeyed the Lord. He didn't protect Eve. He ate that apple, but Joseph, he obeyed the Lord. He protected Mary. He was obedient. He took his wife into his home and he had no relations with her. He didn't lust after her and she didn't urge for him. They had a pure and holy love centered in Christ until she bore a son and then they named him Jesus. In the Old Testament, in you know Genesis, Adam made up names for the animals. He even named Eve. But here, Joseph has given Jesus' name directly from God. He surrenders even that power, that capability of authority. And he gives it back to God, and then God's authority works through him. We see the perfection of women in Our Lady. And we see the healing of this relationship in Mary and Joseph, and then Mary and Jesus. And it's because of Jesus. You know, his redemption, his death on the cross, his resurrection, recreated Our Lady earlier in time. It's so beautiful. So that she was immaculately conceived. And she is that great light that is that perfect archetype of women that then when we look at the Old Testament, we see reflections of her who actually came later in these other women. We say, wow, Esther hoped and trusted God, just like Mary. That was like Mary's great, great, great grandmother, right? <laughs> but 
It's so beautiful to see this, the recreation of womanhood in Christ through Mary. Mary goes on to visit Elizabeth, and we talked about that, proclaiming the greatness of the Lord. Mary was present at the foot of the cross. Mary interceded at the wedding at Cana, right? She used that motherly courage to ask of Christ help. And she wants to do that for us. That's what a real mother does. She's the real mother of the living. She cares about our redemption, but she also cares about our earthly life. She's a mother in all ways. And, you know, at the foot of the cross, Jesus gives her to John and John to her. It's so beautiful to see that. And it's, it's culminated in the book of Revelation. Here she's that woman clothed with the sun, with 12 stars around her head. She is made the queen mother, and she is our mother. So as we come to the end, what I encourage you all to take from this podcast, it's a little longer than normal, is to see how from the very beginning of time, God had a plan for women. And um, this plan is not inhibited by sin or their fault. God works in his plan of redemption. And now, especially for those of us who come after the time of Christ, we have that active grace of his passion and death that we can lean upon so that we can become, you know, true reflections of our lady, that we can become, um, you know, perfected as her children, just as a child takes on the characteristics of their mother. We ask our lady to pray for us who are women, so that we can be reflections of her in this world. And we pray for um, the intercession of all of these women for the men that may listen to this podcast, that they may have a deeper understanding and respect for um, the vocation and the virtue of women, the dignity of women, and that they may um, rightly protect and love and encourage and support them. Um, and allow them to be a helpmate in life the way that God intended, right? And so we entrust all of this and we praise and thank and glorify the Lord for his great plan for humanity in creating man and woman and bringing them together and centering all male and female relationships in his own divine Trinitarian love. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Alleluia, alleluia.